uh, six months ago or so, uh, I was introduced to a friend of a friend of a friend, I think literally like three or four ways disconnected yeah. and uh, was really impressed with, uh, with Daniel, his background and his ability to connect with people. Um, and so he's been instrumental in, 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 in helping us establish new relationships. One of them with, with Padre at uh, the, the folks at Investor. And so I'm looking forward to kind of introducing myself, our background, our platform, and understanding how we can add value to you know, the rest of the folks on, on, on the call today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, JP, uh, for spending your time here today. Um, and uh, Daniel, do you also want to give an intro? Um, sure, sure. So so anybody that doesn't know me, uh, my name is Daniel Calderon. Uh, we started Cal Rove Investment Group about well, not too long ago, about maybe a year ago. And um, we're interested in any any uh, properties over 100 units, uh, value add, kind of your, it's gonna sound really cliche, but uh, I'm a construction manager here local. We I've done development since I was about 19 in one form or another. Uh, I built large multifamily properties for Ashwood construction back before the crash, maybe eight years before the crash, seven years before the crash. I got to go all up and down California building large scale apartment complexes. Um, <clears throat> and after that, came back home and, and built out a few, a few neighborhoods with McMillan Homes. Uh, so I'm very, very familiar with the development space. And, um, you know, if you ever have any questions with putting any kind of construction projects together, you need some sort of uh, advice or ideas about how to run this, or you don't understand what somebody's talking about, you know, the lingo, or you don't understand the jargon about what the, uh, code violations, anything like that, that uh, I could help with. I'd love to speak with you and, you know, just kind of help you push along, but we are, <clears throat> so we're just getting into our first few deals now. And uh, like, I, uh, like JP said, we met about six months ago and we've been working together uh, pretty well, it seems like so far. So um, yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I'm a construction guy who's uh, getting into multifamily basically. So anything with development, Land entitlements, stuff like that. If you ever want to talk about anything or you need a guy that knows some things, uh, just give me a call. I'd be happy to speak with any of you. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you guys for your time. Um, Daniel and JP, I think you guys wanted to talk about the fund, right? Like kind of uh, in terms of your experience uh, in creating the funds, your paperwork is being finalized. Um, oh, well, it's um, fresh on your mind. Yeah. You know, we were just talking about that a minute ago. It it's not finalized yet. So, you know, we were, we were thinking maybe it would be better to kind of put that off to a little later. Uh, you know, we've still got, uh, we're, we're actually working with Bobby on that. Thank you, Bobby, for, for uh, helping with that. And, uh, you know, so I, I think we're going to talk about, uh, you know, JP's pro property management and, and their style of, uh, of what they do and why it is, is like the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> <laughs> Don't build it up too much. Yeah, if, if, if I could take a quick quick minute or two, um, I, I like telling the story of, of Significant, um, mostly because we have a, I mean, I think it's a fairly uh, differentiated approach to managing uh, multifamily housing. Badri's heard this, this this kind of story before when, when I was introduced to him, and we are excited about about, um, about getting our fund launched uh, with, with with investor over, you know, hopefully in, in the beginning of February. Um, so, you know, if I can, if I can use the, the, the stage for, for, for giving that story here, I think the team would like hearing that. Um, so uh, my background, uh, I, I got into multifamily a number of years ago as a sales guy, always look, looking for a way of building passive income. Uh, and, uh, and while I love the, the, the sales job and the lifestyle, never wanted to sell hard drives for the rest of my life. So I, I, I discovered multifamily, I think like many of us, as a way of, of, of building wealth. Um, and because and really overwhelmed the beginning on how many different places one can, can, can build a, a business or earn a living uh, or create cash flow in multifamily, whether you're doing single family, fix and flips, wholesaling, just a variety of ways. But for me, the thing that always resonated was, was, was multifamily. Uh, it just made sense. I remember seeing a, 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 a Burr strategy roadmap on bigger pockets a number of years ago. And it was like, you, you Burr a bunch of houses. And if you don't know what Burr is, it's you, like you buy, you renovate, uh, you refinance and you rent out a house and you take the money that you make and you just roll it into the next one. So the, the rollback was you do this, you know, a couple of times or 10 times or so, and then you buy an apartment complex. But I thought to myself, Excuse why me. don't I just buy, bless you, why don't I just buy an apartment complex? And so um, that's the kind of the path I, I, I went down and, and I've been loved it ever since. Um, and I guess kind of fast forward a little bit forward, I got involved with a group, uh, maybe you may know Jake and Gino, the Wheelbarrow Profits groups. 
a great group of guys that got kind of uh, sucked into um, their earlier uh, academic platform, just kind of learning how to underwrite, learning the basics of how to find deals, things like that. Um, and, 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 and through that, uh, I guess while we, uh, Oh, Nicole, Nicole's one of the, hey, Nicole. Oh, hey, I just forgot my thing. Hey, JP. Oh, uh -huh. hi, nice to see you. Yep, likewise. So Nicole was uh, is someone that is also in Jake and Gino, but we had met uh, at a, a meetup in New York uh, back when I still lived in New York a number of years ago. Um, so anyway, I'll kind of fast forward. I, I met my partner, Matt, uh, through the, the Real Barrel Province community, great group, got along really well, similar work ethic. But uh, the real fun began uh, right, probably about September of 2019. I went to a, a mastermind event in Sundance, Utah. I hadn't been there before. It's a three-day event. Um, and um, it wasn't real estate. It was just kind of general success and, 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 and that sort of mastermind. So I got there late. I got my, my dinner tray. They had food out for everybody. And um, most of the people were kind of mid-conversation. I felt like it was high school all over again with my food tray. I didn't know where to sit. And then all the way in the back of the room, there was a white-haired gentleman with a beard, older guy, sitting by himself. And I thought to myself, I'm here to go meet people and learn things. Maybe I'll learn something if I sit next to this older guy, right? So I walk over, I introduce myself. I say, hi, I'm JP. He says, I'm Howard. Nice to meet you. And um, I get to learn more about him. I learn that, um, you know, uh, he asked me what I do. And I say, well, I'm in multifamily apartments. This is kind of a time in my life where I was re rebuilding myself from IT person to, to, uh, to multifamily operator. And I said, yeah, I buy a large multifamily apartments. He goes, that's amazing. I've had 5,000 units over my 20 year career. Oh crap, it's crazy. So I get to talking with him. I learned some more about him. And it's just a fascinating gentleman. He's, um, he was in the, uh, uh, he went to school for, for medicine. He uh, taught law, he worked in the Senate. Uh, he owned a, uh, a, a materials company uh, and he got into multifamily. And um, you know, it was just fascinating to kind of hear his life story a little bit. But I sent a little bit of sadness. He just lost his wife to Alzheimer's and dementia. And Howard was someone, or is someone, he's not passed away, uh, that really, really loved his wife. Like, so losing, losing his, his wife was a big, big hit to who he was. And I sensed that sadness. And I, I, I said to myself, I'll just kind of hang out with him. Number one, he's fascinating. Number two, we just kind of needed a friend, right? So I spend three days with this guy and I learned more about his secret sauce on what he applied to multifamily to, to make him unique and really me very interested in what he was doing. So I learned a couple of things. I learned that Howard's skill set was about crafting language and using language. I'll give you an example. Uh, Howard spent many years in the North Pacific Northwest uh, in the same circles as uh, Jeff Bezos uh, and, 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 um, and the Microsoft guys and also Howard Schultz of Starbucks fame. And the advice he gave to, uh, to Howard Schultz of Starbucks back, back in the day was, your business isn't about selling a cup of coffee. It's about the culture of coffee. And, uh, and so, you know, that's why when you go to Starbucks, you order a, a venti latte or a mochiato or frappuccino, you're, you're using the, the language of, of, of the culture, not necessarily I just want a cup of coffee. Of course, you could still do that, but that was the, the main principle, the main driving aspect of that. So, so Howard took that approach into multifamily. And what I mean by that is, is the following. So, you know, um, Howard saw that the, the typical, the language we use in multifamily is, can be combative. It's not always the same, but it, it sort of can be. And there's got to be a way of breaking down the stereotypical uh, landlord tenant dynamics that happen. Like, you know, if, you, if I'm the renter, right, uh, I, I don't, do I really have a pride in ownership? Do I really care? Right? Because, because the attitude is, if it's not me, it's somebody else. Right? And if I'm the landlord, it's that approach, right? If, if it's not you, renter, tenant, I'll get somebody else in there. And so, um, so he crafted a, a kind of a system, a way of using language to kind of take this thing out of that. So for example, in Howard's communities and naturally ours, uh, we, we call people members. They're not tenants. They don't live in units. Uh, we invite them to become members of the community. That's why we call them members. They don't pay uh, rent. I mean, they do, but we call it a membership fee, right? Uh, and there isn't, um, there isn't a, a, a lease that they sign. There's a membership agreement, right? We don't have uh, leasing agents. We have membership coordinators, right? Kind of continuing that along. And then one of the, the, one of the really important jobs in the community um, is typically done by our, uh, our community services people, not maintenance people, but community services, because that's what they're doing. They're providing service. And so what, what he found in doing this was it was tremendously successful. It was sort of the, the right people first approach to doing things. And when people lived in his communities, they were you know, willing to pay a premium to live there. They felt like they had a sense of belonging. There was a pride in ownership. You know, one of the things that he would do is, is let people or offer people rather and invite them to pick the color of, of, of the paint they want on the walls, right? You're going to be living into an apartment. Why not pick the paint on the walls, right? 
So, um, so he, he was implementing that and really in training the staff and the team there to really try to enrich the lives of the people that live there. Uh, and that was the key thing. And that was what led him to be the, the market leader, right? You know, when you're doing your red comps for, for your analysis, there's always that one or two properties that are really crushing it in the market. That was Howard's properties. He was, he was always being able to push those, those rents and his membership fees because people would rather give up their left arm and, and leave you know, their, 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 their community and go somewhere else. Um, so in hearing this, this is just kind of a highlight here. In hearing this, I was super impressed and kind of blown away. I remember texting my partner, Matt, uh, over the three days, how exciting this was. And uh, at the end of these three days, I, I, uh, I approached Howard. I said, listen, how is I find the one guy out of 300 people on the first day uh, that is in multifamily? And I didn't really run into any other multifamily people the same, the same uh, during the trip there. And I said, clearly God and the universe put us together. You know, how do we, how do we keep the party going? And so we were, uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to work on an arrangement where we hired Howard as a strategic consultant for us uh, to help us build a spiritual successor to what he did 20 years ago uh, today. And um, so we got back into our, our, uh, our, our, our home office and we worked out our, our core values and our acquisition plan, all those things. And it's just been, uh, it's been really exciting to be able to, uh, to kind of put this philosophy into use. Uh, we closed our, our, our largest deal to date which is a 278 unit deal in Shaker Heights, Ohio. It's a suburb of Cleveland. And this is where we're implementing um, these, this ethic and this yeah. style of management uh, in our, our, our flagship property there. So, so Jay, you know, that's how, the kind of story. How, uh, you want to share with them how, how that, uh -huh. that strategy has helped uh, with the uh, NOI with that property? Yeah, I, I can. And give me a second here, guys. I'll, I'll, show, yeah, I'll show my screen. I'll walk you through some, some data points here, if that's cool with you. All right. So while you're looking, I'm just going to kind of share our... our our kind of strategy for getting into uh, whatever we're looking to get into. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I know when you're when you're going through your modules of, of uh, multifamily training and whatnot, everybody talks about getting a hundred dollars uh, upside on the rents. So uh, there's been a huge huge uh, deal flow lately, like even through the pandemic. Um, and I think we've just been fortunate to connect with the right people, but we're starting to get more and more uh, opportunities to find these properties that are two to three hundred dollars below, sometimes even more. Yeah. Uh, behind in the market rent. So that's what we're looking for is uh, anything over hundred units, you know, up to 500, I think 500 is pretty, pretty big. Uh, you know, anything over would probably be just overwhelming. I think a little too overwhelming, <clears throat> but uh, that's where we're adding value to uh, uh, when, when you're working in numbers of scale like that, it just, it creates a huge, huge upside and the, the opportunity to create a lot of equity in a very short amount of time. Um, you know, we, we source the, the best construction companies out there that can handle the renovations at, at a 5% per month uh, rate, uh, meaning 5% of the units we aim to uh, renovate, you know, every month, giving us, uh, and we get into like a 30, 32 to 36 month bridge loan, which uh, gives us enough cushion, you know, a, a year's time, I think is enough cushion with that big of a property uh -huh. to uh, get your, your business plan in place. That's right. So, uh, That's right. That's kind of where where we're where our strong point is. So thank you, Daniel. Can everyone see my screen? And I know this is a big screen. Let me know if you want me to zoom in a little bit more. I'm I'm happy to do so. Yeah, can you zoom in a little bit more? You got it. Yeah. You got it. No problem. And here, let me. There's no need to show the names. The names are irrelevant for for a moment here. The data is really the important thing. Is that better? Oh, we we can see it. Yeah, it's, it's yes. Okay, cool. All right, so I'll I'll, I'll walk you through. I'm not all of them, but I'll, let me, I'll pay, tell you a story and, and data will make sense here. So we acquired this property. It's six buildings uh, in, in well, back up here. So it's six buildings, 270 units um, in, a, in an affluent suburb of, of Cleveland called Shaker Heights. What attracted us to this property was it was directly across the street from a brand new mixed use TOD. TOD stands for Transit Oriented Development. So a mixed use place uh, where their rents at the time were $800 higher than where we were. Uh, and this collection of pro this portfolio of buildings, they hadn't been renovated in, in a long, long time. The rents hadn't been raised for at least three or four years while the, the current owners, the previous owners had it. Um, and they were suffering from, uh, well, they were, they were suffocating the team on site, the maintenance people uh, from doing anything by, by withholding their budget for things. So it was really, really in, in rough shape. And uh, we saw an opportunity to obviously, you know, there's that rent spread, right? But it was a great location. And we knew if, 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 if the other comps in the marketplace are five or $600 higher than we are, well, that gives us a, a really good 
uh, headway to you know come close to where they they are, not exactly matching, but be be right underneath it and still uh, still doing really well for our, our projections. So um, we took it over December fourth. Uh, these first few leases that we had here, or these these, these signups, were holdover uh, prospects. So they had seen pricing before we took over, um, but but. For the first three or four months, this is you know the January, February, March, we didn't do any any material changes to the property. The only thing that up until some of these these new signups, I'll explain what we did. We did three things. We we trained the staff, so we do a three day on site intensive with, with the staff. Um, so we did training for the staff. We rearranged the furniture in the, the leasing office. We call it the membership house. And the lease, we moved the furniture around to make it look like you know something's new is here. And then we hung a sign on the wall that says. Aspiring to Antastafe. Antastafe is the name of our, the name brand of our style of management at Shaker Heights. Those three things. Um, and with, you know, within the first few new prospects we were bringing in, we were showing them, or I, in, in my opinion, we were demonstrating a, a, a different perception of value than what they were already used to seeing for the same product. So for example, um, you know, this was about a month after we took over, we increased the, the, the rent 29% or that's $228 or 29% higher than what was in place. Uh, then a few weeks later, we went to you know, 21%, 32 23, and then we got to 44, almost 44 and a half, 40, 40, uh, 44.5, uh, or a $419 increase. This was for a, uh, a fully renovated unit. Up until this point, these units, there was no model in place, uh, and these units were essentially um, unrenovated units, but their interaction with our team, how they were greeted, how they were responded to, uh, in our opinion, change the perception of value. And the last data point I'll, I'll, I'll share here, just to kind of drive a point home, because I missed it when I was telling the story earlier, was we do a lot of secret apartment shopping. Um, and I can tell you, I can count probably on one hand how many times people ask me what our first name is when you walk in. Usually the first question out of their mouth from a, a leasing agent is, how many bedrooms do you need? And when can you move in? They rarely take the time, energy, and effort to ask you, you know, what brings you here? Do you have a family? You know, what, what, what are your interests? And build that rapport. And, and that's critical, um, especially, you know, as, as the industry moves more and more towards automation and self-guided tours and, and removing the human element. You know, we're, 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 we're networking creatures. We need to talk and interact with people. So needless to say, in our communities, we make it a priority to greet people and, and through the sales process, build rapport, ask them about their family, what brings them there, and try to help paint the picture of, of what their life would look like living in our communities. Um, and so that, that's the point I'm trying to make here. You know, the, 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 these, these rent increases, these, these, these deltas, uh, in my opinion, are a result of, of demonstrating um, superior value, mostly on how people are, are being treated. Uh, and I think the max we have here up until we got our, our showcase home up and running was, uh, was 52.2% or $487 increase. Uh, over what was in place there. And then later on, it wasn't until like kind of uh, this April, March timeframe, May timeframe, that we were able to get um, uh, our models up and running for people to, to see what the future uh, renovations look like. Um, and I think right now, so Daniel, we asked about total revenue right now, our average increase year to date up until, you know, 12.8 has been about 20.88%. Um, the average dollar amount is 100 and, 181. No, I think it was and how long have you owned this, JP? Uh, one year, a little over one year. Um, we also increased the member utility chargeback. So um, the average in place for like flat rate utilities were around $35 to $40, give or take per month. Um, we implemented a policy where all new signups and on renewals, we, we ratcheted up. We have, I'll show you the menu here. This is how the sauce is made. So we have this, this little sheet here. So depending on the floor plan, if it's a one-one or a two-one or a three-bedroom, we would charge differently for the water and sewer. Uh, but we would present this pricing as one one bundled price to, to the, the the customer, um, and that included pest control, path, uh, trash. Some of the buildings we had to include electric because of the way that the meter is metered. But um, but the point here is, uh, you know, the the average member utility bill back, I think we're, we're collecting is over hundred dollars. So we, we increased that, we doubled that basically was in place. Uh, and I think based on our estimations, we've increased value so far. We've increased our NOI about $360,000 uh, and based on a six and a half percent cap rate, which I think is a little conservative for that area. It's about a five and a half million dollars in value over the past one year. That's awesome. That's great. So here's a question I'm, I'm sure everybody's probably wondering about. So when, when you do implement your rubs and you go to, to boost or to ramp that up, mm -hmm. 
what are you allowed to take that up uh, every month or every year? Or how does that work? How do you implement that with the client? We're, yeah, we're doing that right now. So there's a, there's a couple of scenarios. So one scenario is in place resident, in place member, right? They're already in there um, uniquely. And fortunately for us, the leases that we inherited allowed us, they had a provision there, allow us to make changes at any time during the lease, which is super rare, super unique. So we stepped in, in we stepped in it in a good way uh, on acquiring that property. Uh, but we didn't want to upset the apple cart too much. Uh, and we, we, we made little to no changes for existing people. On new leases, um, we would just say, hey, you know, you come in, here's your, the price. The price for the apartment is this. And then the price, depending on the floor plan, was that chart that I showed you. We would just show them one, one dollar amount motion. So we would say it's either, you know, if it's a one bedroom, you're paying 108. If it's a one by two, it's $83. And if it's a, a two by two, it's 107. And then we would list that includes trash, pass control, water, sewer, and gas. Uh, and that was really it. And, and the feedback that we got from the team originally, when we rolled this out, we were line item in all the things people were paying for. And we sort of got a lot of, the team got a lot of pushback. They were sort of getting a lot of like bitching and moaning about like, this seems like you guys are nickel and diming us and just like disgust. So we decided, all right, great. Let's just tell you you're, you're getting all of this value for one price. And that seemed to I want to say almost eliminate all the pushback on things because I think most people understand and realize, look, I'm going to rent, I'm renting a place to live. There's utilities. And unless it's included in the rent, you know, paying a hundred bucks a month is sort of reasonable for water, <laughs> sewer, you know, all the things. Um, so that's what we've been doing for, for new leases. And then now we're facing, oh, this is my last point, Daniel, is, um, is the increased cost. Like our, our utility bills have gone up a lot. Uh, and, and some of these things are very seasonal, like the, the gas bill for the, for the, for the winter time. Um, and so we're implementing, we, we made an announcement starting January 1 um, that the, the in-place for the in-place residents, we were increasing their bill, I think, 3%. So we were baking in a kind of a, an inflation rate uh, for, that, for that, that rubs uh, that was in place. So are you, does, are you able to, to raise it if your bill gets too big, like with the, with the tenants? Or, uh, is there anything written in it that you can raise them if you need to? Um, it's sort of you have to absorb it a little bit. I mean, what we do is because you, you don't want to ish, ish institute too many changes at much. Like every month, there's this constant you know, thing coming on. You're going to grate on people's nerves. So um, what we have to do is we look at the utility bills and, and, and kind of trend them out. Uh, and then we, we, we bake our budget for the, the, the next year. But if we see overall that we're unable to sustain that level of, 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 of overhead, then we'll have to make a price, adjust, a price adjustment. We want to keep that to at least one per year. I think that's, that's within the line and within reason of things. And how has your retention rate been with, the, with your tenants? So uh, great point. We, you know, when we inherited the property, uh, we inherited some, a, a, a lot of trouble tenants. Um, they, they, they weren't really qualified to live there in the first place. There was a, a total case of, of, of beds and heads uh, when, with the previous ownership. They just kind of threw anybody in there. And so we inherited more dead weight uh, than we anticipated when we, we closed the property. So uh, it set us back. When we acquired the property, uh, the occupancy at that point in time was about high 70s. And then re the reality with the economic vacancy was puts us in the low 70s. So you know we had to cycle through for at least the first four or five months. This is the, this is sort of in the in the, the thick part of COVID too, with with rent, with uh, eviction uh, uh, restrictions. Um, just working through that that backlog and then trying to balance out with new people coming in, new qualified people that, that come in uh, and offset that. So it sent us back a couple of months, but now we're we're I think sitting at ninety three percent occupancy. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have much turnover in these? <laughs> the turnover, um, yeah. So the, the I guess we once we got rid of the, the people that really weren't well qualified for living there, um, the 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 existing people that were qualified tenants uh, that wanted to stay, there was some reluctance because they had heard the old story. Changes are coming. We're going to make improvements. You know, for years and years and years, a lot of them had been living there for a long time, um, and then up until they started seeing the change. They saw the common areas being re redone, uh, polishing the floors, um, replacing the carpet, all of those things. That really, um, it changed their, their, their mindset. And I guess to answer your question, our retention rate ha has been increasing. We, we, we're, we're retaining a lot of people that have been there for a long time, weathered the storm with the previous ownership and, uh, and took our word that we were gonna make the place a better place. 
uh, and, and, and are renewing. So that's coming down to a, a really nice point for us. We're, we're not in a place where we're losing more than we're, we're coming in. No, oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Good, good points. Every, all, all of those are great points. <clears throat> now, uh, I'm sure there's probably one or two, a few people that are on the call that have some uh, asset management experience or they're managing their own properties. But do you have any questions for JP that you'd like to ask? Uh, right now would be the time to. Sure. Yo, I have a question for JP. Jonathan. Hey, Jonathan. Yeah. Hey, JP. Hey, nice to meet you. Likewise. Um, so this this rubs you adding into the rent. Yep. And is it a different name you call out, or is this you just add what we we'll call rent? So how, how would you do that? Yeah, I'll give you the quick lecture. So um, we we don't we're not labeling it rubs. Uh, we're we're just calling it utility chargeback. And because we, we call our renters members, it seemed to reason that we would call it member utility chargeback. Uh, so MUC or, or member utility chargeback is how we, we describe it. And then our team, the, our, you know, our leasing team, uh, when they are meeting with the prospect and they're explaining you know, what's included, what you, what you, here's the money for the rent, and then here's everything else. They just kind of point out to them, here's the fee, right? Your floor plan, they line it up. That's gonna be $108 per month. And that includes and they let, rattle off nine things, the water, the sewer, the gas, the, the park, the pest control, and, um, and the trash. Um, and then, okay. again, it, it, our team is telling us it's, it's being well-received. People just kind of take it as, okay, got it. Okay. So, that, okay. And you call members versus tenants because it's, 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 it's a culture thing? Or is that you talking about the, the, the yeah. Starbucks? Yeah, it, it, exactly. It, it's, it's part of our, our ethic, our, you know, what we're trying to create there, what we're trying to foster there, which is a sense of community. And, and by doing that, it's, it's inviting people to become members of, our, of, of the community there. Um, and that's because we're, we're licensed by this gentleman, Howard Primer, uh, to, to institute what he calls trademark, the, the, the primer ethic. And that's kind of part of the thing. Um, uh, but it, it's, it's part of our whole story there. So that's just one, one element of it. And the other piece I'll just mention to you, because it's, it's tangential to what you asked about the utility bill. Back. We, we were getting, we took over and especially like as operators, you know, you want to get the revenue coming in as fast as possible, especially early on. That's really going to help, help your deal perform well over the long run. And so we were really in, I don't say a rush, but we were kind of in a rush to implement these increases in utility uh, reimbursement as fast as possible. And, you know, again, we kind of made the mistake, but we adopted quickly was, uh, was just saying, okay, you're paying $40 now, now it's going to go up to $107. And then, you know, here's, here's the, the math net behind it, right? You're going to be paying $20 for the water and it's $15 for the sewer and this for the trash. And we heard it from everybody like, oh, you know, I live in a one bedroom. Why am I paying this much for water and sewer? Like you ran into all these different perspective challenges from people. And that's where we made the decision to just shift and, and stop describing what each line item was, was about and instead just describing it as one flat rate fee for your floor plan. And that was really, it. and it really, really um, uh, eliminated a lot of the pushback uh, from the staff there, yeah. especially early on. And how do you feel with your competition in the nearby apartments that similar size and similar you know, age? Yeah, class. Yes. I mean, yeah. are, are they doing the same thing, rubs or no, no rubs on, on the other ones? So there, um, it's sort of a, it's sort of a mix. We have some competitors that are offering, uh, we'll call it classic style finishes, right? It's the same pre-renovation finishes, and you know they 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 haven't really changed their rent rates. They haven't really increased them too much. Um, some are charging a little bit for utility bill back. Some are um, are, are it's like included in the rent. Um, and, and because there's so much, like there's so much competition in the marketplace, there's almost something for everybody, right? Like if, if you're happy with living in an unrenovated apartment and you're, you know, you, you want to play one fat, flat free, there's, there's a product for you. If you want to live in the upscale, the brand new mixed use place across the street from us and pay, you know, for example, our, our wide bedroom, their one bedrooms are almost $2,000. You want to pay two grand and live in a new place? Sure. So I guess to answer your question, because we have so much competition and so much different product in the marketplace, um, there's a, there's enough room for everybody. Mm, okay. Yeah, it's kind of okay. That's good. That's good. Yeah. good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So JP, how did how did you find that type of market? Um, I know everybody's always looking for the emerging markets and, and a great market to buy in. So I know it's always a question in the back of everybody's mind. How do you spot great communities like that, and and uh, how do you go into uh, finding deals in those areas? 
Yeah, a good point. So uh, I'm I'm currently local to Atlanta, Georgia. My partner Matt, he's born and raised o Ohioan, I guess that's the name for it, uh, out of Ohio. Uh, so he had a broker relationship with uh, with a local brokerage, and it's funny. Uh, I see this kind of regionally. The, the the brokerage in that area, that Cleveland market, it's like two or three guys, and they're they're the guys. They're the the the, the, the good old boys if you will, uh, that, that own that space. Uh, if you're gonna do a deal, you buy and sell through them. And so um, they had sent in the deal uh, uh, originally. It was, I think about a year, year, almost two years ago or so, a year and a half ago. Um, and when, when he shared with me, I was at first a little overwhelmed with the size, but more importantly, I was impressed uh, and amazed and intrigued by the location, right? I love the median income in the area with it almost $80,000, but more importantly, we had that mixed use TOD, the Van Aken district, right across the street. Now, let me, let me share my screen. I'll show you a little map uh, of where it is. So that this way it kind of gives a little bit of uh, perspective there. It's kind of a fun thing. Um, and so we, it was an on-market deal and we competed on it. We, we happened to meet the brokers at NMHC. Uh, they did like a little pre-interview with us. Um, and then we were invited to, uh, to bid on the deal. Um, and uh, it's hard to write and type at the same time. So give me a second, guys. Here we go. And I'll share my screen. Um, and uh, we ended up losing, we didn't make it, we, didn't make, we made it the best and final, but we lost the deal. Uh, it went to another group. And uh, what we learned, right, this is back in March of last year, 2020. And that's when COVID kind of came out. And so um, we, we understand from the brokers that they, um, I think they renegotiated something and the sellers wouldn't put up with it, and they 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 just kind of walked away or broke the the, the deal, uh, and they went back to the brokers. The brokers went back to the last group of guys that were in in the best and final. Everyone else had moved on to other deals, and Matt and I were we were still looking for deals, and so we were in a position to uh, to negotiate uh, to get under contract, and we did. Um, of course, the deal fell out of contract, you know, three four months later because we couldn't raise the equity, but that was half the battle. Uh, and uh, we were able to get it back under contract and, uh, and close successfully in, in December of, um, of, of 20, 2020. Okay. I'll show you where the, where the property is. So you can kind of, uh, yeah, you never know what's going to happen. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, challenging when you're getting into your bigger deals. Sure. Yep, yep. Especially when you're doing your own self-management. Um, you run into all sorts of obstacles along the way. So I'll give you a quick, quick tour of the area because it's, it's kind of a, a unique. I mean, I don't really run into properties that are surrounded by so many golf courses, especially when you're doing value add B and C classes. So, um, so here's here's our main our main property. By main, I mean it's where our leasing operations happen. It's called the Aristocrat. Uh, we also have this property right over here called Golf View. Um, and let me see if I can do this 3D so you can see the get some perspective there. Uh, we also have Fairway, and then this other place called Marchmont, right? right over here. Uh, the other things are condos in the area, the big golf course over here, big golf course over here. And if I zoom out, there's also another golf course and then another one, I think on the, so, yeah. So we're, we're just golf courses everywhere in this area. Uh, but more, more importantly, the thing that really kind of blew our mind is this community right here. This is that mixed use TOD called the Van Aken district. And they've got this hall in there, you walk in, it's almost like a flea market. You can get some really kind of uh, nice coffee, some, some, um, there's some really good food there. There's, a, uh, there's an ice cream district. It's a really nice walkable area. And here's their light rail uh, transit. They call it a rapid there in Cleveland. And this takes you into Cleveland in the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, and we just learned that the group that built this upstairs Van Aken, this apartment complex, they just bought this lot and they're gonna build, they got approved to build 15 story apartment complex in the area. Uh, we didn't know that at the time. We just learned that about six months ago or so. Um, so it was just kind of a really interesting, interesting area and, uh, and loved having, you know, this brand new product across the street because you know, the, the rising tide rises all, raises all boats, or however that saying goes. Sure, sure. <clears throat> no, thanks. Great. That should, uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, good points, everything. Does anybody have any other questions about property management or, or anything you'd like to ask, JP? Okay. So Micey took a little break. Um, so I guess we can go kind of into the thousand foot details of, of uh, what we're planning to do with the fund and why. Uh, what do you think about that, JP? Yeah, it's a good idea. So uh, we, well, as you all know, that, that the market cap rates are pretty compressed right now with all the competition and whatnot. <clears throat> and uh, let me just, I'm kind of going to rant about the uh, cap rates and some people's view about cap rates. 
uh, I've talked to several people about like buying multifamily and whatnot. And every once in a while, you run into somebody that that has a you know a professional that looks over the deals before they'll allow them to invest or something like that. But <clears throat> cap rates is a very important aspect of any deal, but we don't really vet a deal based on a certain cap rate. Like we don't need to be uh, above a six or a three or anything like that. The cap rates don't really matter going in. If it's a strong market and you're getting a property there that, that you really like, you're probably going to have a pretty compressed cap rate. And <clears throat> if it is a great market and you're doing all your homework correctly, you know, like you should be. And, um, you know, you guys have all been in mastermind and I'm, I'm sure you're probably all well aware, aware of your market studies and whatnot. If it's a compressed cap rate, the market's probably not going to change a whole lot in the next few years. Um, <clears throat> I know that the market cycles happen in a certain way, uh, but the fluctuations will probably not be too great if you're looking in other areas uh, than what you live. You probably got a pretty good idea of what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. So based on that, <clears throat> you know, we're not concerned with like a three or four cap rate uh, going in. It can be a great market. You, everything's going to be compressed there. What we are concerned with is the absolute value that we can create within a relatively short amount of time. I mean, if we've got a great property in a great neighborhood and it's behind two, two to $300 in rent, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's kind of a no-brainer. If it's got the same structure, the same bones, and it's a great property, uh, it's got a great uh, job diversity, and it doesn't matter what happens with the market. Everybody's going to be working, most of the people anyways. And um, you know that <clears throat> you can create the value and still get your upside um, that's what we look for. Uh, and if the market does fluctuate a little bit, we, we give, we give ourselves at least a half a percent in uh, cap rate variance. Uh, right. sometimes we'll even go more than that, right, JP? I mean, we've gone yep. as far as a full percentage point on the upside and we still create, you know, uh, a, a great amount of, uh, equity in, in a very short amount of time relative. And I'll, I'll add a little data point to that. I think along your lines. Sure, sure, sure. So yeah. when, when we are underwriting the deal for the, a refinance cap rate, like in two or three years or the exit cap rate, there's two parts to that. There's the cap rate based on the NOI. And then, the, you know, that represents a, a price per unit. And we kind of look at it, like there's a sniff test, natural sniff test that has to happen. Like we're buying, for example, we buy a unit of property for $125,000 per unit. And then based on where we're going to push the NOI, our projections and the cap rates, and we're saying this is going to be worth $270,000 per unit in, in three years. Does that seem like it makes sense? Probably not. So what we'll do is we'll adjust the cap rates up to make that price per unit balance back out, which what we think would be a, a reasonable price per unit valuation in a future time. So I think uh, that's that's how we we in the real world apply that concept uh, that Daniel's talking about in, in our underwriting models. Hello. Agent number one three two three. How can I assist you today? Yes, I'm just trying to find my. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm about to hear his whole conversation with whoever he was calling. But um, yeah, so that's in a nutshell, that's kind of, uh, you know, my, my opinion, my view on, on cap rates. Um, it's great to do your market studies and have an advisor. But if your advisor doesn't know what he's talking about, maybe you should ask someone else. But, um, you know, our uh, value add is an absolute value add. Uh, 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 how would you say business model? And um, it's been proven time and time again. And there's a lot of opportunity out there right now. Uh, in, in several different places. I know the markets are shifting a lot towards development, which is great for us because it's kind of my area of expertise, what I've done all my life, and, and I'm really comfortable with it. But um, there's a lot of opportunity out there. You know, I mean, if you guys are looking for deals, get with your brokers. You know, if, if you have a market that you're in or, or looking in different places, just keep the relationship going. Stay in their minds, you know, keep a good contact with them, and, and eventually your deal flow will just ramp up. I would also add, um, keep making offers on deals. Um, even if you know you, you, you perceive you have no chance of winning it, make the offer anyway, because that's how you're gonna build the rapport with that broker over time. Uh, some of the deals that we're working on, I mean, the brokers we're working with for at least three or four years, and really for us just now, we're starting to, last, within the last year, really making that kind of progress with the broker where, not that we're being taken seriously, but you, you kind of get elevated from, this annoying person that calls them all the time at looking for deals to kind of being a, a, a true player in their minds. Um, and so I, I, that, that's a great point, Daniel. Thank you. Hey, sorry, I had to step away and just join back. Um, I, I, I recall that you showed this Excel file about uh, how like it, the rate 
uh, rent bump that you had on some of the units and etc. Are those uh, class B units or class C? Um, this change in word you mentioned about membership counselor or something like that versus uh, lease agent, for example, are you know do are they more more applicable for class B or do you make it also available for class C? And the reason isn't because class C isn't worth it to have it, but because class C sometimes just don't look very good. <laughs> and uh, changing the word, implying that they should expect more when the place isn't so good sure. compared to class B. Yeah. No, that's a, it's a great question. It's a great point. And the beauty about this and how we're like saying this, there's the power of and here. It, these things don't have to be mutually exclusive. So, you know, in the beginning, I, hopefully I came across that what's important for our business and, and how we um, deliver service is we, we want to deliver a high level of customer service. Typically, I guess most people assume that's only reserved for high end, ultra luxury, uh, upscale places or clientele. And it doesn't always have to be that way. So when Howard was, was, was in the business, he was working on the same B and C class assets that we were working on. Right. Um, the, he wasn't operating class, brand new construction kind of class A luxury housing. He was you know, working with blue collar, white collar style properties. Um, and, and, and the more important thing is, if you think about it, the people that live there, for the most part, they're sort of not used to being treated that way. Right. Like it's, it's almost like you're applying, um, I don't want to say resort style, but like uh, hospitality style service into multifamily. That's kind of the, I think the best way to kind of give the bottom line punchline of what are you doing? It's like hospitality in multifamily coming together. And, and, and to, you know, I'll share some observations. Your, what we've noticed is there is this, um, there's a lot of limiting belief that happens with the people that live there. You know, like sometimes people don't see themselves as worthy enough to either call themselves a member. And not that it's demeaning to call yourself a tenant, but we're just trying to elevate them to, uh, to a, a higher level of respect. That's really it. And some people will gravitate towards it and some people don't. And that's okay. It's not a, a, a right or wrong way. Uh, it's just us differentiating ourselves in the marketplace and really trying to help people think of themselves in a higher stage of what they're used to being treated as. Um, so there's that. And then these properties, these are built in the, from the 40s to the 60s. So these are as, I mean, even calling them C-class technically is, is a stretch, technically to the definition, but these are C-class properties, right? But our competitors in the marketplace, we have A, uh, do we have any B? Not really any B, mostly it's A and us and everybody else is, is all kind of C, stretching it. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's just been an interesting, um, interesting, not an exercise, but, but observation in the marketplace on how people respond to being called a member or, or, or even be invited to live in a place where you're treated in such a way. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, no, it, I could see how it would kind of show an appreciation for the uh, tenant or the uh, member, I guess. Yep, yep. Yep. And it would kind of differentiate from the mindset of uh, somebody that would appreciate you taking better care for your uh, members, your tenants. Yep. And I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the thing that like people forget about the member thing. It's just like, it's almost like a, what, right. That's really out of it. Um, it's mostly the, the thing that I think stands out in most pe people's minds is just being greeted with a smile and, 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 and a welcome, like a warming welcome. That's kind of really the, the bottom line takeaway. Because sure. um, I, I just see it all too often where it's just like, oh, can I help you? Like just like a, a, a deadness, and that's not how you're gonna win customers over. Sure, sure. No, I can see like coming coming home to your apartment and like kind of yeah. being appreciated for what you do. It, it would actually make my job be a little more tolerable, you know? Right, right, exactly. It takes this thing off. So, do you guys offer like valet service, trash service too? Like, for uh, yeah, we're in the pro so. We can part of the problems in these buildings, they have these long hallways. And when we inherited the property, the carpet, they had outdoor indoor carpet, but mm. it, was, it was so beat up with trash stains, all these things. So one of the first things we did was replace the carpet. And we've been, it's on the list of things to do, implement the trash relay. Uh, it, it does cost, the local trash relay service costs us, I think it was $18, I think 15 to $18 per unit per month. Um, so that's that adds up real quick with 270 units and you can't you can't do one building you have to get i think pretty much the whole property going um so we were waiting to get all of the carpets in all of the buildings done which were about halfway through um to implement it but that would that's going to be one of the programs we implement 
trash valet, kind of mandatory. It's baked into that member utility chargeback. It's already paid for, and um, and then they're not dragging the trash to the. New you know, I used to I used to have a different opinion about uh, the valet trash. I could always I could never understand why people would actually pay for that. So I went to go visit a friend of mine the other day, and uh, you know we opened up the pantry because the trash is in the pantry and the thing is full. So I'm like, oh, I can't put this in there; it's overflowing. Right. And I go to the uh, countertop. There's a couple little bags of trash. So I'm like, why? Is and I'm thinking, you know, I'll just go through the trash for her. And I'm thinking, you know what? The trash can is like way down in the middle of the property. I, I gotta walk somewhere. I don't really want to go okay. through the trash. You know, and I was, how inconvenient. You no, know, I thought, and I asked, I said, hey, do they offer like, uh, do they, they, do they come outside and if you can put the trash cans outside, do they offer valet trash to go come and pick it up? You know, because I could actually see like firsthand, like why they would want to pay for that. You know, $25 a month. You don't want to, if the trash can is that far, you don't really, it's kind of inconvenient to go throw your trash, you know? Uh, yeah. And, and it's, each property is different. Like a lot of the garden style properties, uh, the, the, the trash container, depending on how big it is, it's either like in the big, at the front of the property, which always turns me off when it's that giant, like 30 yard container and it's always overfilled. At least that's my experience when I do farm shopping. It's always overfilled and you got to like put the trash in your car to drive it there. That doesn't make sense. Or it's like a five yard container in the middle of the parking lot. You got to lug the trash into there. Or in our case, these are like brick buildings. So there's like a trash chute somewhere. So you got to get in the elevator and you know, all this, all these things. So if we can eliminate that as much as possible. Um, and I think it's sort of overcoming whatever uh, existing culture there was or clients we're getting over the mentality. And if new people come in and know that trash valet is included, I think it's less of an overhill battle um, if there is one. Um, but, but yeah, their value is there eventually <laughs> if the people don't like the inconvenience of it. Yeah, I really like the summary you gave of saying that uh, treat somebody as a resort as a, or being in a member, you know, I mean, uh, I, I, I think that's a nice little one line summary. And I know you and I will be talking more as we onboard you for to create a fund on the investor. Are you planning to use that as a pitch line for your fund also saying that all properties we invest in are not just routine multifamily? I mean, that will stand your fund out too, uh, I think. So. No, it's an inter interesting uh, idea, Badri. Yeah. The, the fund for us, it's, it's an exciting opportunity. It's, um, it's a new world. And, and, and part of the reason why we're going to talk later this afternoon, at least with, uh, with Sanjay, is um, there's, there's elements I feel like where we haven't really thought about too much and it's sort of like, as they come up, we'll sort of figure it out. But I, I, haven't, I haven't yet spent the, the brain power thinking of what is the marketing, what is the positioning of the fund look like in relation to you know, what we're trying to do, our story and our kind of value proposition in the marketplace. But that's really good feedback. Yeah, I mean, it, even if it's a one-line pitch, why are we different than all the other multifamily funds out there, right? I yep, mean, yep. I know a number of other people are creating funds. So I'm not trying to, <laughs> sure. but it's always nice to have uh, uh, a kind of a distinguishing factor, the one tagline which distinguishes yourself, you know, so. No, that's, uh, that's true. Yeah, so. Yeah, we oh, can chat more. Great yeah. point. Oh, look, looks so, like Jim, Jim Biggs just asked a question. Where did you say the inspiration? Oh, sorry. It's actually me, Missy. Oh, you're not. <laughs> I locked into Jim's account because uh, right now this meeting is uh, under his Zoom. But oh, it's, it's Missy it's asking. <laughs> so what was the question? Uh, I think in the beginning you mentioned about how you got inspiration from to this different style of asset management. Do you have any resources for us to like deep dive a little bit more? And uh, not just kind of the names, but also more of the psychology, the framework, the paradigm shift. Yeah, I think, I, I, yeah, I, I think, uh, so this was through H Howard Primer. He's the, he's the sort of the originator or inventor of this, but he drew a lot of inspiration. Um, I, I could share a book that, that was fantastic. Uh, it's called Firms of Endearment. Firms of Endearment. It's a, it's a wonderful book. It's a little okay. older, but it's, it's the, the, the gist of it is it's a case study on businesses that make their customers number one. You know, not the shareholders, not the investors, um, but either, either their customers or their uh, employees, number one, and how they went on to, to outperform their competitors in the marketplace, uh, you know, over the course of 10 years, I think a thousand percent more profitable. Uh, so companies like Patagonia, uh, BMW Group, Honda, Wegmans, those are all considered firms of endearment where they make their, their numero uno, their, their client, their customer, uh, and kind of going above and beyond whatever they can do to, to, to make them happy. Because if they can, everything else kind of falls in place. And that's really the, this, the idea, the central idea of what we're doing here. We're not making our investors number one, we're making our, our clients, our members in this case, number one, and everything else kind of falls into place. Got it. 
I think Stephen has a question. Yes, I had a question. Thank you. Hey, hey uh, JP, right? Yes, sir. JP, Stephen Cutzer, how are you doing? I'm great. Yeah, I, I kind of missed the, the beginning of this uh, Zoom. I had a, a doctor's uh, you know, obligation. But but anyway, um, I want to clarify one question that you, uh, one statement that you mentioned earlier. You said, just get out there and do more deals. I, I didn't catch the, the prior piece of that. So, so kind of, I kind of brought it, you know, it's kind of brought in at that, at that kind of actually when you were just saying that. So, so clarify, can you clarify what you mean by that? Because some people are telling me, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure first before I go into my next question, you know, uh, because it, you might clarify it. I might not have to go into the next part of the question. And, and then I would say go, go into your next question because I'm a little fuzzy on, on the, go into the next thing and I'll see if I can talk to you. You said just put more deals in to start building a relationship. Are you just saying? Got like, it. Uh, I got it. Yep. I got it. So that yeah. was, in, that was along the lines of um, st building the rapport and continuing to grow the relationship with your broker. So, and, so, so, so what I'm trying to ask you is basically you were saying, I didn't catch the beginning of that. That's what I'm trying to say. You're saying, put more offers in as far as even if we're off or even like, what do you, what did you mean by, oh, you know, I, you, I had just finished, I had just finished a small segment about how uh, we were finding deals or sourcing really good deals in the markets, you know, uh, cause right now there's a lot of uh, great deals coming up to market and uh, JP had kind of uh, commented on it and that's where he'd taken over. I was, I was talking about building a rapport with the broker so you can get the great deals. I mean, there's a couple ways to find good deals. I mean, if you're going to do the, do the uh, legwork and call them directly or, you know, send them something in the mail, uh, whether it's a letter or a gift or, or something like that. You know, uh, you want to you want to put yourself kind of at a high level and, and put yourself a great a great letter together. Um, something that looks branded, you know, your company and, and tell them what you're doing. If you're going to do that type of marketing and then follow up with a phone call uh, if you're going to yeah. send anything in the mail. Um, but I mean, another great way to do that is, is building great relationships with your brokers. You know, uh, and JP was just commenting on that, saying, you know, even if you're you know, you're not going to get the deal because uh, the other guys, the bigs are going to beat you, you know, just, just go ahead and send an offer anyways, you know, just to build okay. rapport. And that's, just, that's the piece that I was, that's the piece right there, what you just said, even if you, even if the other guys are going to beat you, if you think you're going to lose a deal, just send it in. Any, that That's yep. kind of answers my question. That, that's yep. kind of, okay. So I don't need to go into the next question then, okay. uh, but, but I did, I, that, that's it. That's it for me. So, so uh, thank you very much for clarifying guys. Thank you for raising that question. Right, thank you. And I think Nicole had some questions. Uh, I thought of more. So I, I just wanted to make a quick comment on that also. So when when you have lost the deal, you know, or you saw you see them sending you something about they closed something. I mean, it, it, I've heard this before. I've actually never practiced it, but it, it's a good idea to call them and congr congratulate them just to keep you. Yep. Around. Yep. Like right yeah, now. Yeah, I just reply. I usually just reply back. I forward the email back to them and say, you know, good job, congrats. Yeah. Yeah. You, you use a CRM for your brokers as well, or what do you use to, to stay in contact with most of those to build those relationships? Uh, so I, I mean, there's really like a small handful of brokers that I'm actively talking to. It's probably like five or six. So it's enough where I'm almost in regular conversation with them, but deal, a deal will come up over email. I'll reply back, Hey, what's the whisper on it? And then I'll call them and get more detail about it. So it, it sort of happens organically. And then for the ones that I haven't talked to in a while, um, it might just be a phone call or a text. Hey, are you going to talk? Um, I would, you want to get to the point where you can have these texting relationships with, with the brokers and, and you can do yeah. that by just asking questions about the deal, right? And when's the call for offers? When's what, what's coming, you know, what, what, when's, um, where are the, the deal offers coming in at, you know, I'm getting ready to get my LOI in and it just, it sort of happens organically. The, the reason why I say that is basically, you know, obviously we can't remember everybody. And the reason why I say it too is basically like, you know, birth, a lot of things that are important to these people, you know, getting to know their families, getting to know certain things about them. And that's, that's the reason. So how, how do you keep those profiles? I mean, cause obviously, uh, you know, yep. we can't remember everything about no. everyone. You know, right. you know, so how do you, how do you manage that? That's what I'm trying to say. What I do is, is for everybody, I, when I meet a broker or I, I learn their wife's name or they have five kids or whatever it is, I'll just make a note under their contact that, you know, they like history. Um, they enjoy sushi, whatever else. Right. And I, I, I keep it on my phone. 
so it's ba it's basically kind of like us that's your smaller collective crm because I, I, yeah. i'm thinking about doing this on a, a different scale mm -hmm. and with multiple team members so, so we have to all kind of be in sync and uh when, when they get a phone call we have to know exactly who it's from and we, yeah we, we yep I, I think uh hubspot allows you like hubspot as a crm allows you to put populate factoid data about people and there as well where everyone kind of share it and see those resources yeah. together. Sounds like, sound like you're in a few different markets, Stephen. Yeah, yeah. We're we're uh, we're looking in a few different markets, and, and I'm, we're looking to scale. You know, so uh, we're uh, you know say dream big, you know, or don't that's dream right. at all. That's that's, right. that's that's the way we are, and that's the way that uh, our team wants to work. So so that's kind of why why we're at you know thinking about other things. You know, and and I, I agree with you. You know, there's. Texting, you know, uh, you, you want to get on those levels with with the brokers that you're actually involved with, you know, on a day to day basis. But but obviously there's new there's new young guns every day, and we have to make sure that we know everything about everyone. We need to know our, our client base. I mean, essentially they're not our client, but essentially they are. You know, that's mm -hmm. how I look at it. They're, they're, yep. You have to you have to build that relationship with them, and the way you build those relationships is basically showing that they actually mean something for us to actually yeah. compile yeah. that data. You, you know what I mean? So so mm -hmm. that's kind of why I said that. You're right. You're right. Yep. So, um, yeah, I like I like the movies too. They're, they're always trying to make money and, and make the most value that they can, and you know they'll they'll go out of they'll go out of their way to help you as much as they can. So, you know, it's always great to to get one of those guys uh, on a personal level, just one on one, see what they're into, see what they do. But I mean, it's all about relationships, really. You got to take a general interest, a genuine interest in what people do it's, it's, it's kind of hard to do uh, when you're doing it on a huge huge level and remember everything like that sure. you know it's more of a specific it's a specific area approach or uh training somebody how to do that and having them work that area you know yeah yeah definitely it's different different i guess everybody's got their own different flavor that they're they're uh comfortable with um and i guess that's part of this whole business you have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable you know mm -hmm. and just push for it Hey, Nicole, do you have a last question? I think we're about time. Yeah, it's just uh, kind of going on the same thing about broker relationships. And so I know there's a fine line between being someone who is pleasant to work with, but then still being aggressive enough to follow up on a consistent basis without being that annoying, you know, person or investor who keeps calling, you know, the broker every week or every other day. How often do you think at first is good to start establishing that relationship. And if you're trying to talk about, oh, how's your family or this and that, like those are little things that some brokers at the very beginning don't wanna talk about because that's too personal and they just wanna cut and dry. All right, we're, we're talking to make money and that's it. So how do you transition into actually getting to know them how, without being too annoying, but still being persistent enough to be top of mind? Um, can, I, can I say what, what, what I wanna say? Yeah, please. So basically, how we look at it, obviously, those relationships, we're, we're not going to gather all the information. We're not going to start like prying and start asking. I mean, after a while, those things will develop and we'll just have those notes like he like how he does on, on a smaller, you know, with, with his with his system that he's working with. But we want to have it uh, for everyone we're working with. I mean, we, we want to know everything about everyone. And, and as we grow and as we progress, uh, we want to build those relationships. So, so, so I don't I don't know how long you know, we, we just it's like a constant contact type thing. To, to get, eventually get those things and, and like he said you call them and you want to be able to text and basis with you know obviously you got you know, different buckets of you know, people that you deal with a b c d e you know it, it depends on how many people you're working with but you level them off and and then at the top you get to a point where, where, where you're more involved with the a bucket list or the b bucket list and then as you to me this is how it works in my mind so to me over time those relationships build so i uh, you know, a lot of these people send out a lot of spam and, and uh, they, they try to like, you know, stay in contact too much. And, and that's annoying because, you know, the way digital marketing is, is, is uh, I, I would say once a month, that, that's, that, that would, that's what I would say. It's kind of like do an outreach uh, campaign, like once a month and kind of, uh, and, and once you build those relationships, you'll, you'll add those notes. Like, like uh, JP mentioned that there, those things will just come, you know, as, as you, as you go on. So that, that's all I had to say. That was my input on that. You know, just to add, the, add, to the, add to that a little bit, um, <clears throat> a lot of brokers, they, they will know that you're, you're serious about your business. So if you have some sort of uh, criteria that you're looking for specifically, I would put your branding on it and send it into them. Uh, first contact, 
you know, first conversation, just say what's your email, you know, this is what we're looking for, but have it very clear and defined about what you're looking for. It needs to be at this level or more, you know, and if they're sending you deals that don't meet that, you're, you're responding to them saying, hey, can you tell me about this deal? They will never take you seriously. Uh, but when they do send you a good deal, uh, follow up with them, talk to them, get involved, you know, tell them about your team, get your team on the phone with them, let them know that you're serious, you got your financing in place, you know, uh, get your lender on the phone with them, you know, so they know, so they know that you're somebody that's going to close. If they don't, if they smell that you're not able to close, they won't take you seriously at all. You need to uh, have all that stuff in order. Take the time to brand your stuff and, and uh, really focus on what you're what you're going after, and uh, just just hit it like that. You know, uh, when they find when they send you something good, just go after it. And uh, you know, once you've built that rapport with them, they'll they'll start to tell you about anything and everything just to get you to close the deal. You know, but uh, they just need to know that you're serious. Yep. <clears throat> Great. Very pleased about the branding and, and, and you know stuff like that. That's it's very huge, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you, Daniel and JP, for sharing today. Um, we thank we you. appreciated the topic, and it's definitely refreshing to to think differently about asset management. So yeah, definitely, we'll have to follow up with the one about the fund once we get it started. So. <laughs> yeah, good job, guys. Great job. Thank, thank you. you. Thank everybody for your time. Thank, thank you all so much. Bye, everyone.